Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Trek Wars at OSU. That's Oregon State University. I'm Dr. Joseph Orozco. I'm a professor of philosophy at Oregon State University, and I'm the co-founder of the Inares Project for Alternative Futures. The Inares Project is a forum for conversations, projects, and initiatives that imagine a future free from domination, exploitation, war, and empire. One of our projects is this one, Trek Wars at OSU, in which we look at major sci-fi franchises such as Star Wars and Star Trek to help us understand our social, political, and economic realities and to imagine possible transformations. Today, we're going to talk about the depiction of science and technology in the Star Trek universe. I'm joined by Dr. Mohammed Noor. Dr. Noor is a professor of biology and the dean of natural sciences at Duke University. His area of specialization is in evolution, genetics, and genome evolution. He is also the author of Live Long and Evolve, What Star Trek Can Teach Us About Evolution, Genetics, and Life on Other Worlds, published in 2018 by Princeton University Press. It examines the way that genetics and evolution are represented in the Star Trek universe. He's also the host of BioTrek Explains, a YouTube video series exploring the science of Star Trek, as well as BioTrek with the Admiral, a video series that he co-hosts with the actor Jane Brooke from Star Trek Discovery. A frequent speaker at Star Trek science fiction conventions, Dr. Noor is a technical science consultant for the Star Trek television franchise. In our discussion today, we talk about how he started to work in the science of science fiction in his teaching at Duke University. We explore why it is that Star Trek is different from other science fiction universes in popular culture today in that it makes science and the scientific method of problem solving as something that is central to the storytelling in the universe. We briefly talk about why this is important in the world today in which science and scientists are often treated skeptically by large segments of society. So let's turn to our discussion today with Biotrekkie, Dr. Mohammed Noor. All right, we're here uh, today with Dr. Mohammed Noor. Uh, Dr. Noor, pleasure uh, to have you on the program. Uh, it's a deep honor for me to have you here as a fellow academic who takes Star Trek seriously. Uh, and uses it to explore not only the Star Trek universe, but their own field, which for you is biology. So um, I know that you do a lot of different presentations in, in public culture, like a lot of different comic cons, and you have your own uh, uh, YouTube series, Biotrekkie Explains. Yep. So you, you are quite uh, uh, out there in terms of public science education in Star Trek. So for me, it's quite an honor for you uh, for, to have you here. So uh, uh, thank you very much for being on the program. It's, it's totally my pleasure. I'm honored to actually, I'm honored to be on the show for exactly the same reasons you listed too. It's great to you know, chat with another academic who loves Star Trek, who uses it effectively in teaching. And I, yeah, same reasons. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Well, you know, what I always do when I'm talking to people about uh, uh, Star Trek, I, I ask them about what made them a fan. And uh, generally, a lot of people begin by thinking about themselves as a fan of science fiction. So um, how did you become interested in Star Trek spe specifically? Were you a, a fan of science fiction before you got into Star Trek? It was. I mean, my, my parent, my father's an aerospace engineer, so that sort of pre <laughs> pre directed things a little bit in that direction as well. But yeah, I mean, I like science and I like science fiction even before my first exposure to Star Trek. But I think I saw Star Trek for the first time when I was around the age of eight or so. And after I saw the first episode, I was I was immediately hooked, and I tried to find it on my local TV station and try to find. This was back in the late 1970s, so this was original series was in repeat, yeah. but. I love the I love the exploration aspects of it. I love this the, essentially the process of science. Like, oh, here's a problem. We don't understand it. Let's try to work it out, as opposed to you know the usual like, ooh, bad guys, shoot, shoot, shoot. <laughs> Dude, those are fun too, but uh, different, different kind of fun. <laughs> was it was it something about Star Trek that uh, I, I you know I talked to some people mm -hmm. too that tell me that Star Trek influenced them in their career choices or where they sort of their direction in life was, was Star Trek something that made you be interested in science? It's hard to separate those two things because I already had an interest in science and it, it certainly. It certainly made me feel good about the fact that I was interested in science. So I would say it reinforced what was already there. I wouldn't say it created it uh, de novo. But yeah, I mean, again, it's just, you know, I remember the very first episode I saw was the original series episode for The World is Hollow and I've Touched the Sky. And it, it's one of those ones where 
you know, immediately what's happening on there is, is these people on this asteroid's perception of the world is challenged right off the bat. I mean, that's the, essentially the plot of that whole episode. And that was fascinating and seeing, you know, how do they, how do they face it? How are other people exploring it? You know, what is truth? I mean, it was really interesting. Right, 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 right. Um, I'll ask you this in general, do you have a favorite Star Trek series? In the- I always say it's like picking a favorite kid. I don't think I can yeah. do it. <laughs> it's definitely what I'm in the mood for. I mean, you know, if I want like, a, you know, not, not including the current series, because it's hard to, it's not fair to compare the current series to the old ones since they're, they're still coming out. But, right. you know, if I want like a long narrative, you know, something like Deep Space Nine had those great arcs associated with it. Voyager is great for just like a one-off episode. Next Generation, especially if you skip the first couple of seasons, is often right, really right, fun. right, right, right. And I enjoyed Enterprise. I know a lot of people bad mouth Enterprise, but I really enjoyed it. I thought it was fun, especially like the last two seasons. I thought were really fun. So. Yeah, those are my favorites as well. I think that those are really there's some really uh, good backstory and a totally. sort of complex uh, character development in the. Yeah, last I really liked the Zindi arc. I mean, I thought that was that was fascinating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, it was yeah. clearly a post 9/11 influence, but you know, yeah, it, it is what it is. <laughs> Are you are you a fan of uh, science fiction in general, or is it just Star Trek for you? No, I, I mean I, Star Trek definitely is is you know top of the heap. <laughs> but you know I've watched Battlestar Galactica, I've watched Firefly, I've watched um, The Expanse. I mean a lot of other different series that, that have come out. I, I enjoy too. Well, let me talk about this in terms of your work. So sure. uh, uh, a few years ago, you you started to integrate uh, mm-hmm. Star Trek into your teaching yeah. of, of biology at Duke yeah. University. Um, and so um, I, I wanted to know what prompted you to use science fiction in your course. It's great. Uh, it's a great question. So I, I started initially by doing public outreach talks before I brought it back to the classroom. And I, I, I had gone to a convention. I'd never, I didn't know that conventions had science talks. I just assumed it would just be like, here's a panel with the actors or the writers talking about yeah. their experiences or something like that. But going and seeing it and just seeing the level of enthusiasm, and this is really what pushed me, man. seeing the level of enthusiasm of people in the audience. I mean, they were, they were all over. I mean, the first talk I gave uh, on science fiction and in, in using, or sorry, on science using science fiction, or Star Trek in particular, was in 2016 at Dragon Con. And I was very nervous. I had no idea what the reception was going to be like. It was essentially an evidence for evolution, processes of evolution talk. Those were the scientific messages I was getting across. But the way I did it was talking about why there are so many humanoid species. Like, you know, could we see that? What are some explanations that come out in Star Trek Canada? And how does that work out? And I, I just had no idea how that was going to go over, but I presented it there and there must have been, there was well over a hundred people in the audience and, you know, which, you know, Dragon Con is gigantic. So you often get a lot of people, but still that was, that was a good turnout and the enthusiasm, the questions, people were all over it. They loved it. So, I mean, just that level of positive reinforcement thinking like, wow, if we can reach out to people in this way, because I'd given public talks before that, but I mean, when you give a public talk at like a science cafe, I mean, a lot of times the people who show up are the regulars, like the scientists and, you know, other scientists who come in, things like that. Yeah. You know, that's great. It, it gives people more, uh, more nerves. But this is a group of people who probably, if they weren't watching my talk, they may have been going to a you know a panel on the CW's Flash or something. It was something completely out there. So seeing the success of that and the effectiveness of that in grabbing people in the public mm-hmm. venue was inspirational to me for trying to do it in the classroom. So my first uh, foray into that was with one of my colleagues at Duke University. His name is Professor Eric Spana. He had already been presenting at Dragon Con and things. And he had he had a talk on genetics using wizarding and Harry Potter. He had a talk on the super soldier serum from uh, Captain America. Yeah. He had a lot of sort of biology talks like that. So we partnered together and we did this, what's referred to as a spring break program. So these are this like literally one week classes. They're, they're all day. It's basically from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. You spend all day with students. It's not supposed to be something really heavy. Like you don't want to go in there and do, you know, intro calculus or something. Right. Like, nothing against calculus, but that would be terrible. <laughs> but it's supposed to be something that's just fun and engaging, things like that. So we started off by giving a couple of these talks, but then also getting the students to use their own interests and explore things and say, okay, now you've seen what we've talked about. Pick your own fandom and develop you know, what the science is behind it. And an important thing about it, especially with science is we don't want to do fish in a barrel. We don't want to talk about all the, all the ways. Oh, that's not perfect. Oh, that's not perfect. Yeah. You know, that, that's too easy. <laughs> so no, make it work, figure out a way that it is possible, or at least get it really close to being possible. Mm-hmm. And that's a much more interesting challenge. It's not just, Oh, well, they should have said this. Okay. <laughs> yeah. 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 I, but then, I wonder, oh, sorry. I wonder, oh, no, I just wonder about this in terms of like, uh, a, a side sort of question about uh, getting students in, interested in Star Trek. Were, yeah. were your students, when you started the, talking about Star Trek, um, 
did they did they know the, the franchise? Great question. So that, that class wasn't specific to Star Trek, but later after I wrote my book, yeah. I actually did a class called Genetics Evolution Star Trek. And I used my book as the textbook for that. And I polled the students ahead of time because I was curious about exactly this question you're asking. And I'm trying to remember the exact numbers. I think something like two thirds had never seen any Star Trek. <laughs> and then a couple had seen, you know, I think there was one who had seen and one or two had seen the original series, like with their grandparents. Oh, that made me feel old. <laughs> there was one who had seen Enterprise, and there were a couple who had seen the reboot J.J. Abrams movies, and that was about it. Yeah. You know, things like Deep Space Nine, Voyager, nothing. Yeah. But they signed up. I think they just thought, "Wow, this is an interesting, different sort of take." You know, and this you know, has become a popular course for you, right? Well, I've only done it the one time, but oh, you know, okay. I'm, I'm, keen, I'm keen to keep doing it. The, the problem is I, I did it the one time and I would have actually been doing it yearly, but I started as Dean of Natural Sciences right after that. And that essentially took me out of uh, out of undergraduate classrooms for a time. I've been trying to get back in there, but this job is a little bit overwhelming. So I can't quite fit that in there. But my plan is absolutely to go back and do it again. And I've already talked with our director of undergraduate studies about doing it again, but it was so much fun. It was so much fun. <laughs> And like, and so your question, coming back to your question, you'd asked about like if they'd seen it before. They had, most of them hadn't, right? By the end, I also asked them, I asked them a couple of different questions, but one, two in particular I want to focus on. One, are you more likely to take more biology classes having taken this? And vast majority said yes. You know, there, there are a couple who said no. But honestly, one of the ones who said no said I was already going to be a biology major. So I was like, okay, fair enough. <laughs> right, right. The other question I asked is, are you more likely to watch more Star Trek? Because, I mean, in class, we would actually watch either whole or parts of some episodes. Yeah. And just about every one of them said yes. And you could see it because what would happen is sometimes we'd start the episode a little bit late. Because the most important thing was getting across the science. The point wasn't to teach Star Trek. The point is to teach the science. We sometimes start the episode a little bit late and we would go past the end of class. So when the class time ended, you know, the equivalent of the bell, we didn't have a bell, of course. Yeah. <laughs> I'd say, if you want to get up and go, it's fine. You know, you can go ahead and go. Often nobody would get up. Everybody's like, no, I'm staying. <laughs> yeah, that's, I, you know, I, I teach a Star Trek class too. And what I found is that over the years in teaching this class is that um, almost no one has seen any Star Trek uh, amongst my students. Uh, and if they Even the J.J. Abrams ones? Yeah, it's the Abrams ones yeah. if they have seen anything. Yeah. Uh, and, the, you know, there's one or two I'll get here or there that are, are fans, but they tell me that most of it is sort of a nostalgic thing for them, which I found is true of a lot of Star Trek uh, fans in general, is that they started with, uh, you know, like a parent or a grandparent yeah. or something yeah. like that. And it's something that they associate with those really sort of beloved family moments. Yeah. And yeah. so Star Trek for them, it has this kind of really sort of special sacred space in their lives. Yeah, one of mine uh, was but, exactly that. <laughs> yeah, and so so a lot of my students have said, you know, that they they didn't know anything about it. And that's, you know, that has kinds of some benefits in the sense that you're introducing them into a world that they don't necessarily have any preconceptions of. And so they can sort of fall in with you. Yeah. In, yeah. in a kind of way. Um, so that can be uh, sort of interesting. But I have had that experience where students tell me, oh, you know, I'd be kind of curious to explore this world a little bit more mm -hmm. uh, afterwards as well. It was fascinating seeing their reactions to these episodes. Because I mean, I know these episodes like backwards and forwards, right? But it was fascinating seeing their reactions to some. And like some of them were a little bit dark. And at the end, they're like, oh, man. And they'd be like moved, like clearly visibly moved. Wow. Okay. This yeah. is really interesting seeing these reactions from first time viewers. <laughs> so uh, did, in your class in teaching Star Trek, did you focus on any one particular series no. of the franchise? No, we, 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 we used everything that was available at the time. So we had, you know, we actually literally watched episodes of original series, Next Generation. Deep Space Nine, Voyager. I don't remember. Oh, yeah, we did Enterprise. We did, um, yeah, I remember a particular uh, Cogenitor. We did that episode from Enterprise. And we even did like one or two Discovery. Because Discovery had just started at that point in time. So. Well, so I wanted to ask you about teaching Star Trek in this way. Yeah. Uh, um, I, you know, I, I've talked with other folks who teach Star Trek in mm -hmm. their classes, and particularly mm -hmm. science folks. And they tell me that they, they enjoy Voyager in particular because yes. of the the way in which it uh it, it told a lot of stories uh, uh about various sort of scientific uh discoveries mm -hmm. there was, science was at the center of a lot of the storytelling it really was. Janeway was a, a science officer uh mm -hmm. she came into command and all this so in, mm -hmm. in your in your experience teaching star trek did you find that any series were better for demonstrating scientific ideas than yeah. other series definitely for genetics voyager was, was really really strong so and and it's not quite fair to compare it to Enterprise because there's fewer of them. <laughs> there's only forces in Enterprise where it's the seven of Voyager. But I think a lot of it was just that it's more recent. So that really helped. I mean, the Human Genome Project was in full swing. They were constantly doing genetic sorts of tests and they were describing things. And, you know, the, the 
there's a video that I'm about to release on my YouTube channel. It's on dominance and recessivity. I'm using the Voyager episode, Favorite Son. And they had a whole bunch of genetics aspects in it, like, you know, genes being turned on or off, you know, instincts associated with genetic differences. I mean, all sorts of things in there. And that was not uncommon. It was interesting because they didn't really... It was rarely that was the center of the plot, but often it was the kind of thing that would come up, like when they were working with the phage, for example, with the Vidians, yeah. you know, a lot of the, the ways they dealt with that. But I, I will say that particular one's a little bit funny because it's not, it doesn't seem like it's actually a phage, <laughs> but that's okay. Because phages oh, yeah, attack bacteria, but I mean, the name's a little bit funny, but the way it worked was kind of interesting. So, <laughs> yeah, I want to, I want to explore that with you about the way in which uh, Star Trek represents science. Yeah. Like, what's interesting, you know, is that the way in which, uh, as you, as you pointed out, how Sirius sort of represents the state of scientific discovery yeah. technology at the moment yeah. in which it's uh, being aired. Like I think about, um, Think about uh, uh, the original series and um, uh, something like uh, the episode "Conscience uh, of the King," where yeah. they're they're trying to find out who, uh, you know, uh, whether uh, Caridian is Kodos. Or yeah, they do the voice print test. The, the, yeah, the voice print, <laughs> right? Is we would so never hard. do that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, considering it's all the different kinds of ways now in which you can manipulate audio and voice technology nowadays, you think about oh, yeah. like how unreliable something like oh, that. Yeah, would oh be. yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. But so, fair. I mean, at the time, we hadn't even sequenced DNA yet. You right. know, fair. You know, it, they, they, they used what was available at the time. And another example kind of like that is uh, Dr. Crusher, Next Generation at one point in time, refers to the 100,000 genes in the human genome. That was, at one point in time, thought to be the, est the estimated number. So that was right for the time. But now we know it's actually a lot fewer than that. So right. again, you know, it, it, it self-corrects over time. And this is a, a really recent example. So with Star Trek Discovery in the first season, there's a throwaway line by Michael Burnham where she says, this is referring to the tardigrade. She said, like its microscopic cousins on Earth, the tardigrade acquires its genes through horizontal gene transfer. That was fascinating because there was a paper published in 2015 about the genome of the tardigrade. And it suggested that something like 16% of the genome had been acquired by horizontal gene transfer. Sounds great, except the next year there was a paper published saying that was wrong. <laughs> and they didn't catch that because there weren't press releases around that one. But, you know, clearly they were inspired by it. I mean, the whole spore drive thing was clearly inspired by the actual Paul Stamets, you know, yeah. who's a mycologist who uh, studies yeah. fungi, uh, by his TED Talks. And you can find tweets from Brian Fuller from 2013 about that TED Talk. So clearly he was inspired by this <laughs> to then go ahead and work in that spore drive. So I mean, you see these things coming out and having worked with the writers some now, I mean, they love science. I mean, the number of times I get on like a Zoom call and they start off with your job is so cool. And I'm always a little bit baffled. I mean, I, my job is cool. It's true. But I'm like, you write Star Trek. Right, <laughs> I mean, right. How much cooler is it? Can there be? <laughs> Let's talk about the, these these things, right? Star Trek and science in a kind yeah. of way. The, the, the question that I have for you is, is this. Um, and it's something that I see like in my uh, in my own field when I talk mm -hmm. about uh, Star Trek is that, you know, speaking from, from a philosophy standpoint, I know a lot of professors who use Star Trek in their classes. They show episodes and things yeah. like this, uh, but it's typically to illustrate an idea, uh, some theory like so someone wants to illustrate the the ethical theory of utilitarianism and they'll show an episode and so star trek is used as an illustration of yeah. a philosophical idea yeah but the way that i've approached this in my own work is to talk about star trek not just illustrating ideas that other people have come up with but that it has a philosophical sort of uh, it has philosophical insights in the storytelling that it is making it takes positions on questions about human oh, yeah. nature or the universe oh, yeah. or how things are working. And so I wanted to sort of explore this uh, idea with you about science mm -hmm. and to ask the question, you know, since you use this to illustrate scientific concepts and biological concepts in your classes, is there something about the Star Trek universe that makes its stories useful for teaching about science? Is there a way in which yeah. it presents science as part of its world that makes it accessible for people to be able to explore science. Absolutely. And, and so here's some of the background to this question in, in my mind, is that I think we're at a, an interesting sort of historical moment yeah. in which science as a practice yeah. is uh, looked upon skeptically by yeah, you're, you're large exactly where I was going to go. Society, yeah. right? <laughs> and, you know, the Star Trek is, is kind of unique as a modern scientific, uh, science fiction franchise because it, it portrays science and technology 
not as things to be scared of or to be afraid of, but as tools that can be helpful in the the march of human progress, right? So this is something different than something, say, like Black Mirror, which presents mm. technology. Yeah, dark as, view. Yeah. yeah, this sort of dystopic dark view of where science and technology might take us. Yeah. Star Trek has, has always had this kind of different take on the role of science and technology in human life. Absolutely. And I'm wondering whether, you know, since you've really explored this a lot in your work in some sense, I was wondering if you have any kind of insight into what makes the stories useful for thinking and teaching about science. Sure. So I have a lot of thoughts on that. <laughs> so first of all, I mean, one aspect which I love about all Star Trek is um, it really accepts right off the bat the value of what we refer to as basic science, right? This idea that exploration in and of itself is valuable, even if it's not a, we're trying to solve this X problem. We're not trying to find the cure for cancer. We're not trying to you know, stop this asteroid from rolling up this planet. I mean, they'll have that too, but in and of itself, I mean, the fact that there are these science ships out there, I mean, like the whole the whole point of the Enterprise in the original series and in Next Generation is to explore strange new worlds, as though that in and of itself has value. And that is, you know, that is worth a huge investment. It's worth people dedicating their lives to it. That's something we don't really see uh, as well represented more broadly in, in our culture right now. As you said, there's a lot of skepticism towards science, which is ironic given the time we're in. We, we're coming out of, you know, a, a terrible pandemic. But What's amazing about the pandemic is the, the the miraculous, I mean, I don't mean that in a non-science version, I mean, just in terms of how great the science has been. We went from, well, at least within the United States, you know, the first cases to having a vaccine in under a year using entirely new technologies. I mean, like, everybody should be in awe of yeah, the that science of that. Right. It's truly amazing that, you know, when are and, and these are not just, you know, off, off the shelf. These are have been very rigorously tested and they have incredibly high effectiveness. That's mm -hmm. amazing. And that's the kind of thing I could imagine in Star Trek. I mean, the number of times like in Deep Space Nine with the quickening or things like that, they're coming up with these vaccines and they're, and they're, they're working very hard on them. And, and so uh, that that no, that's not a great example in terms of basic science, because those clearly have big applications. Mm -hmm. But. There's many episodes where they're exploring something and there's a problem, but the problem is done. And they continue talking about it. They're like, let's think about this more. What, you know, where could it have come from? Let's, you know, might we see this again? And there's a lot of this big thought is supposed to be problem gone, move on. <laughs> so that's one aspect. Um, another aspect I like, is, so me as an evolutionary biologist, Star Trek right off the bat embraces evolution and common ancestry wholeheartedly, which is not mm -hmm. something we see in the United States uh, in general. You know, the idea that all life on Earth is 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 directly related, like, you know, literally, if you go, if you make a family tree that's big enough, you'll see me and you'll see this tree that's outside on the same family tree, literally, yeah. right? And that comes up, for example, uh, just as one example, it's not a great episode, but it still it, it makes this point, the Next Generation episode, Genesis. It takes it takes that as an absolute given. There's never any doubt that you know that Troy is related to an amphibian, or that you know Barkley is related to a spider, or things like yeah. that. The way they do it is not great, but you know, set that aside. But it's taken just as a given right off the bat. And then the way they try to make it even such that other species are related. Again, there's some problems with the way they do that, but just taking that as a given is something that you know 50 percent or more of the people in the United States don't accept. Right, and right. So I'm thinking of like something like the chase. Uh, that's the one I was thinking. Of. It's not. Yeah. There's problems with the way they do it in terms yeah. of the science, but the punchline is great. You know, there's one origin of all life. You know, that's great. Now we don't necessarily assume that with respect to alien forms, but I mean, it's it's yeah. fine. There's nothing wrong with it. But it's amazing that they assume that already with respect to forms on Earth. So that's great. Right. Right, yeah. right. And then finally, I mean, it's just the beauty of it as opposed to say like something like Battlestar Galactica or anything like that. It's, it's, it's I mean, nothing against Battlestar. <laughs> they, they really focus on the science and they have this, you know, internal continuity and they don't, they don't invoke non-science explanations very often, right? It tends to, I mean, with the exceptions of every now and then there's a cue or something right. kind of fun, bad, but right. largely the answer lies within science and it's never this, uh, you know, you sometimes see in a lot of uh, science fiction this, like, oh my gosh, people are too focused on the science, but they're they're ignoring X, Y, or Z. Right. You know, right. I don't. I don't mind that X, Y, or Z is also something that is also considered, but don't make the science diminished as a result of that. You know, which is what some some, some science fiction will do. So those right. are the That's, aspects uh, of it. Anyway. Yeah, I think that you know, I, I I I sense that in a lot of sort of science fiction uh, in this kind of dystopic mode is that there's. Uh, kind of a feeling of wanting to find other explanations for the way things work. And, you know, there's this other genre of fantasy, which exactly is related uh, exactly. to science fiction in this kind of way, but it sort of, it posits, 
you know, supernatural yeah. or magical kinds of causes in the mm -hmm. world. Star Trek does have those kinds of things that happen every once in a while, yeah. but it, it, it is the sort of thing that, you know, you can imagine eventually we might be able to figure out how the Q works yeah. or yeah. why the Metrons are the way they are. Exactly. You know, exactly. It's, it's not magic in the sense there's some kind of scientific explanation that might really? eventually be able to be given about why these beings are the way they are. Exactly. And related to that, they often have false starts, which I love because that's what science is, where they'll, have, they'll see something, they think, oh, I'm interpreting this as blah, 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 blah. And they'll go through and they'll interpret it more that way. And like, oh, there, here's an observation that goes against it. In fact, it's actually X, Y, or Z instead. I love that because that that's exactly what we do. That's exactly how science should work. I mean, we don't we don't take things as as absolutely set in stone ever. I mean, we always are always like you know willing to take on new new things and see how well they fit with the overall framework. If they don't fit, then we have to revise the framework. So science, uh, so Star Trek sort of respects, uh, the, as science. you said, the sort of the, ba the basic sort of science and 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 yeah. the, the the kind of a kind of a an attitude towards the world that yes uh, is, is a, a, of interest of trying to explain things. Mm -hmm. um, There's value I, I, in trying to explain them, even if it's not you know our lives are in jeopardy kind of things. Well, and it, it, I'm thinking of, of you know sort of folks like Picard or someone who are interested in exploring the world yeah. for the sake of just knowing there's a kind of wanting to know yeah. about how the world works exactly that's not tied to something like exactly imperial conquest or something exactly. or weapons technology which is yeah. something that we often in our world often tie science uh as a uh, as a practice too yeah and neelix makes fun of janeway about like boy they can get back to the alpha quadrant a lot faster if they stop stop at uh, stop stopping at so many stellar phenomena but she's like no this is what we do <laughs> this is what we want ah, to do. She, she sees well, so maybe too. yeah maybe that was a hindrance on janeway's <laughs> yeah <laughs> was, she made uh, it home <laughs> yeah that's true that's true um, <laughs> oh spoiler oh no just kidding <laughs> <laughs> Well, I wonder too, you know, there's something else that, that strikes me as Star Trek is, you know, it, this kind of wanting, uh, is depicting uh, human beings as interested in wanting to know about the world. You think of also too about just the way in which decisions get made in command situations, right? Yeah. I, I've often said that one of the most important scenes in, in any Star Trek is going to be the briefing room or the ready yeah. room discussion where yeah. you have all these professionals come together to share their views about what might be going on, what's the nature of the problem, what dilemma they're in. Mm -hmm. And they talk about, you know, and sometimes this is a really sort of uh, long sort of scene in which they're throwing out mm -hmm. options in various mm -hmm. ways. And this seems to me something that fits really well in with a kind of a basic kind of uh, idea of scientific methodology and research. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because again, they're, what they're doing is they're, they're tossing out hypotheses and people say, oh, but this observation is inconsistent with that hypothesis. Okay. I mean, that's great. That's exactly how we do it. And again, you don't see that in a lot of other sci-fi. Right. I think that's right. I think that's right. Well, so so it, it respects a kind of basic scientific approach. But, yeah. um, you know, so, Star Trek is often talked about, too, as, as a series that, you know, predicts technological development or scientific advances. I wonder, does it actually predict it or does it does it essentially influence it? Well, so things, so that, good point. Good point. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, the 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 smartphone and all these kinds of things, you know, yeah, flip phone even a meme about that. I think that sort of goes on talks about how it's influenced the development of all these various kinds of things from like Zoom technology, yeah, to, you know, iPads. I mean, they basically had pads, uh, quote unquote, in the next medical generation. tricorders and things yeah. like this. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, so there's there's ways in which it influences, it imagines different mm -hmm. kinds of advances. Do you think that there are ways in which Star Trek has uh, gone wrong or created false expectations about what is scientific? or technologically possible? Hmm, that's a good question. Well, I guess, I mean, one of the ones, this is outside my field, but I've heard I've heard her speak about this. Um, Star Trek science consultant, Dr. Aaron McDonald, oh, gives yeah. talks about transporters. And she says, yeah, that's not going to happen. <laughs> but she says one of the issues there, I don't remember the details of anything, I'm not a physicist at all, but it has, it has to do with the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, that like, basically getting to all those molecules back in the same way. Oh, right. she's, like, she's like, that would never happen. Now, the way Star Trek pays lip service to this problem is they have these quote unquote Heisenberg compensators. Yeah. You know, it's just this box that who knows what it does, but it fixes that problem. <laughs> right. Well, this but is her comment is like, whether... that wouldn't happen. So I think that would be, that would be a lot of lies we were describing. Like that's, yeah, so I wonder, you know, we were talking a little bit about the sort of optimistic view of yeah. science and the world. And this is so this is where I wonder sometimes where Star Trek maybe 
whether there's a limitation here because uh, very often I think that there sometimes there's some kind of technology that they have that compensates mm -hmm. for these kinds of problems or there's the inertial dampeners which yeah. deal with the problem <laughs> of gravity in space yeah. or, right so there's there's some kind of technological fix and mm -hmm. so I wonder whether that um, that sometimes gives kind of false expectations about what something like space travel might be. Yeah. Whereas something like, you know, a lot of people have been talking about how a series like The Expanse is much more realistic about what space travel could be about and the dangers involved in space travel in which Star Trek makes it seem as though you're just on a cruise, but in space. Yeah, yeah. So I wonder whether that's the, the kind of optimism of Star Trek and its uh, attitude towards science and technology might give us a kind of naive or false view about what is involved in something like even going to Mars? Yeah, yeah, no, and one of the biggest things I think that will come up a lot too uh, is this this lack of time aspects to it, right? That you know, if if, if you travel at a certain speed, you're going to get this sort of time dilation thing, and everything somehow like everybody's still always on exactly the same time in Star Trek. You know? <laughs> like a little bit unclear how that works out. <laughs> But yeah, right. that's another case of like, as you said, the false expectations where people just think, oh, we can just go to blah. But I mean, things like interstellar, they have that where, you know, at, at this big gravity center, time was moving much more slowly than the, the people yes. who are in orbit. So that's a good example of a, a better application of that sort of thing. Right, right, right. No, I have a, a, a colleague who teaches in physics and astronomy here, and he often uh, is, says that he worries that we have a, a, a sense that particularly this for the the race to mars mm -hmm. that uh that this is creating lots of sort of in his view sort of problems because it's not going to be an easy thing to do mars no. is a hospitable environment no. and i mean i love it just as an inspirational idea but i mean what do we do when we get there like okay right. now we're on this we're on this big rock <laughs> that... <laughs> Wait a, a really big radioactive uh, rock yeah <laughs> exactly it's very very little shielding from like cosmic rays and things like that you know there's almost no atmosphere like okay now what <laughs> yeah 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 i mean so, i love uh, it just in the sense of you know what what that sort of race will inspire is, of course, all sorts of technological advances that may help us here on Earth, too. But in and of itself, getting there is like, OK, now we're there. I mean, we knew it was there before. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, right, right. Good point. Good point. Well, you mentioned before that, you know, you work uh, uh, as a um, uh, consultant for Star Trek. Um, uh, and I, I'm curious, um, how did this come about? Uh, how did you become a science uh, a consultant for Star Trek, the, the franchise? Right. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's not completely wrong. <laughs> no, it happened. It started for me at, um, and again, at DragonCon. DragonCon seems to be inspiring a lot of things for me. But uh, one of the times I was there, I gave a presentation uh, with Dr. Aaron McDonald. And uh, one of the people in the audience was, or actually three of the people in the audience were some of the cast from Star Trek Discovery. They just came to watch the talk. And one of them turned out to be, this is Jane Brooke, she turned out to be a Duke University alumna. So she came up after, was like, hey, I went to Duke University. I mean, you know, she was there before I was a professor there, of course. But um, we had a great chat and things like that. And I actually invited her to come out to Duke. To, and she actually was a guest at my, at my Star Trek class. So she came and just talked to the students about like her experience at Duke University, how she went, how she moved on eventually from there into Hollywood, things like that. So that was really fun. But so for those who don't know, she portrays uh, Admiral Cornwell on yes. Star Trek Discovery. So she's a Duke alum. Exactly, exactly. So then um, while she was visiting, she she had actually gone, it's funny, she had gone through my book and she had like annotated with so many questions and thoughts. And like she was like, she had gone through it much more rigorously than most students go through it. It was fantastic. So we had really lively discussions about that. And I mentioned to her I was interested in um, consulting. And she said, oh, you know, I'm friends with one of the writers. I'm happy to, you know, give her a copy of the book and tell her that, about your interest. So she did that. I had a conversation with that person. That person then relayed my name to the showrunner. Had a conversation with the showrunner, and then that's how I then got brought on for Star Trek Discovery for season three. Wow! Wow! Yeah. Congratulations! That's really great. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> uh, my my question, I guess, too, about this is: What do you find exciting about this work, which is a science consultant for a major science fiction franchise? That's yeah, really it's fun because I mean, there's a lot of similarity to what we do. In, uh, weirdly, there's a lot of similarity to what we do in the lab. In the sense that you're given a problem. So the writer was contact. So for example, for season three, they, they one of the contracts, they gave me a couple of different contracts, but one of them was uh, there's an alien species, has to have a disease, has to be communicable, has to you know fit these criteria, it has to be associated with something they ate from plants. Or sorry, not communicable, it's to be associated with something they ate from plants. So 
then essentially it's up to me to go through and like read a bunch of papers and figure out like, okay, what works and what doesn't work, essentially develop hypotheses. The nice thing about it is like once you develop a hypothesis, that's kind of done there. <laughs> There's no experiment needed. Right. Essentially like, does this fit with all the data available? And they're essentially handing me the data saying, these are the parameters, what fits with that? So that's really fun. And then the second one I did was, was with Dr. Erin McDonald. She actually ended up being brought on to Star Trek Discovery at the same time as me. But her her point, her point position, I should stress, her position is different from mine. And she is the science advisor for the whole Star oh. Trek universe. I'm just sort of contracted. So I like to I, say she's the sheriff of science. And I'm, I'm somebody who's sometimes deputized. <laughs> so, you're a contract person. Yeah, exactly, exactly. But we got to work together, which was great because I already knew her and I was already friends with her. Yeah. We got to work together on coming up with an explanation from season three for, uh, for Discovery for the burn and it had all these physics aspects which i don't know anything about it had these biology aspects which again they'd handed to us so i had to come up with something that worked in terms of the biology she had to come up with something that worked in terms of the physics yeah. and we had to use our creativity with it too you know so it had to be based in some sort of reality but we, had, we got to use our creativity at the same time now for that first one i mentioned for the disease one i ended up deciding to use prions but what i did actually when i sent the the materials to the writers i actually included scientific citations for little pieces because you know you know how, how academics are academics love to knit so I wanted to give them the ammunition back if somebody says, wow, there are no such thing as plant prions. Like, actually, there's a paper from the Proceedings of National Academy of Sciences from 2017 that shows prion-like behavior. And, you know, give them the stuff they need. I don't think they'd actually ever use it, but it also kept me honest, too. That Footnotes, can't just right, cite your work. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And again, very similar to the process we use in academia. So that I love it. It was, it was just really fun working with, you know, different people on interesting problems and coming up with cool hypotheses. And then, of course, you know, it was absolutely, you know, amazing to then see it then come out on the screen later like oh yes that was me <laughs> so, so when do you understand this process so the way that you brought is that they have a sort of an idea of something mm -hmm. for the storyline they then yeah. consult with you Correct. to see like how it might work out and then they take from your your write-up aspects that they can work into the story is that yeah and sometimes i mean it's, it's it's more collaborative than that in that it's not just a like i hand them something and it's done and like i'll often have a follow-up conversation or follow-up email thread or things like that and i'll say yeah you know this is a little bit too much of this or oh doesn't that assume why and I'm like oh it does assume why i didn't realize why it was a problem so i'll have a little bit of a back and forth and you know i, I know there was one idea that came up with it actually michelle paradise who's the showrunner for discovery she had a uh, a twist on it and when she mentioned it, i was like oh actually i like your idea much better than my original idea that's oh, wow. that's much better so it's it's more collaborative but basically yeah i see i see yeah so, but, uh, but in the end you know you give them stuff and then you know you give it to them and then you release it you know there's, there's no i mean like i like to tell people it's not an episode of of nova or national geographic right. or something like that they have to come up with things where like there's maybe two lines of script that people say and maybe something in terms of the visual but it can't be long because people just don't that's not what people are watching Star Trek for. <laughs> well, this is what I, I wonder about, like within your work. I mean, you you are a, a public science uh, teacher, right? So you do, you know, you do your lab work. You also yep. have a, a job of teaching your students, but then you also are a public scientist in a way. And now you've sort of brought this into you know, the entertainment world in a kind of way. And I, I wonder, do you think that Star Trek is a um, uh, can be a useful or a responsible vehicle for public science instruction. Does, do you think it helps us to, do you see part of your work as, as maybe helping people to understand science through Star Trek? Yeah, that's a great question. So one, one thing I have to stress right up front is that story will always trump science. Like that, that's always going to be true when you're working with uh, with any sort of media. That again, it's not Nova, it's not National Geographic. So, if well, there's no way for X to be Y. It's like, well, we need X to be Y for the story. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. that said, that said, the the writers are very acutely aware of how many people are inspired to go into science. And I'm saying science in a broad sense. I don't mean just like natural sciences, but you know, philosophy, ethics, anything. You know, people are inspired by Star Trek. So. Yeah. They want to basically, if there's a simple way to make it right, that, that maintains the story, they always want to do that. They're very keen on doing that. And, you know, and again, it, it has to be, it has to be simple. It has to be something that an audience member who, who hasn't attended an hour long seminar ahead of time can understand. <laughs> right, right. But in that sense, yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, the, the biggest thing that it does is, are the aspects we talked about earlier. In a sense, it just inspires people to really think big questions and to approach things in a scientific or academic manner. So those are things that they're, they're always going to be very keen on. And then beyond that, in terms of the specific, as much as they can get right, they're very happy to get it right. And sometimes I'll even get nitpicky with them. I'll say, well, you know, can we just make this one little thing there? And, you know, if it's something where it's just a change of visual or change like one word in something... They'll always say yes. I mean, sure, oh, wow. you know, yeah, they're, they're, you know, they're happy to do that. 
you know, so, again, uh, keeping in mind they don't want the actors to have like you know a long line of gobbledygook <laughs> right right there's enough technological gobbledygook that they have to sort of get that. exactly exactly right. I, I i so uh it's uh you and dr mcdonald uh do they have other consultants in terms of their stories that they do for other aspects for science for technology or, so i can't or, speak or to anything forward i can only speak in the reverse because i have non-disclosure agreements so oh i see yeah for, yeah, yeah. for star trek discovery it, uh, as far as i know for season three it was just the two of us i see I see. Now maybe for other seasons, yeah, I can't, I can't speak to anything else. <laughs> gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. No, I was just wondering whether they had like consultants for other sorts of areas in which they sort of rely on their work, historical yeah. consultants or something of that sort. Yeah, I mean, there weren't any listed in the credits. <laughs> oh, <laughs> gotcha, gotcha, three, gotcha. So I don't know, but it's possible that they had like somebody just reached out to a researcher and asked a couple of questions. I don't know the answer. Gotcha, 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 gotcha. Well, I'll make a picture myself here. If uh, if Star Trek is looking for a philosophical consultant, uh, just like they have uh, on the Good Place, yeah, uh, I love. Uh, I'm show, up for the, the job. Yeah, <laughs> I my 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 ideal right is to become a. Uh, I want to open up space to uh, to have on a starship a chief humanities officer. Ooh, right. So because they did. I mean, I've seen so far. I've seen uh, sociologists. I've seen, you know, psychiatrists, psychologists, yeah, yeah. Uh, and then there was a historian, right? So we've had social scientists, we had one humanities person, we've seen historians, we've seen librarians. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so the original right, series had the library, I remember that. Yeah. Right, exactly, right. And so, uh, so I'm making a pitch for a chief humanities officer. Okay, in the of higher, okay. Uh, after all, you know, uh, the other thing I point out to, to people is that uh, uh, Captain Pike in Discovery did point out that he got uh, an A plus in ancient philosophy. Oh, that's right. <laughs> so, uh, so I know for a fact that philosophy instruction is important at Starfleet Academy. So they mm -hmm. they, they need a philosophy consultant on Star Trek. <laughs> I mean, they certainly reference they reference Sun Tzu. They reference things from you know philosophy all the time. So no, yeah. it's very philosophy heavy in lots of ways. Yeah. That's the thing I always appreciate. And then also making up uh, uh, philosophical movements. There's a mention of something neo transcendentalism, I think, is in the, the next generation oh. as, a, as a reaction against the kind of technological uh, developments of the Federation. There's a whole episode, I can't remember the name of the episode, but I know that uh, they mentioned the development of various philosophical movements within uh, the Federation. Yeah. So, oh, actually, I, I, I realized I neglected one thing when I said that nobody else was uh, involved as a consultant. Uh, I forgot the uh, Mark Okrand was involved as a Klingon language consultant, uh, he was yes. involved for season three. Uh, yeah, for discovery of course, too. Of course, of course. Yeah, I forgot good. about that. Well, so what's next for you in terms of your projects, both either uh, uh, as a, a consultant or as a, a Star Trek writer, as a scientist? Sure. What's next? So I don't, you? I don't have another book in the works because that took a lot of, <laughs> as you know, write, writing a book now that, that took a lot. <laughs> I need a little break on that. I'm continuing my my YouTube series, Bio Trekkie Explains. And again, each of the, actually, it's funny because now that is being sponsored by my grant from the National Science Foundation. Oh, because well, there's, remember, the National Science Foundation has a broader impacts thing, and part of that is outreach to the public. And originally, I was going to go into classrooms and things like that and use sci-fi, uh, but you know, I got my grant in January, so that that didn't happen. <laughs> Great, congratulations! Oh, thank you, thank you. But I thought instead, I mean, I could do there's, there's a research part to it too that's unrelated to that. But uh, for the outreach part, I said, you know what, I'll I'll do these videos as part of that, and I talked to the program officer. And they were keen on that. So that's great. So, you know, I'm just picking up these little science concepts. And right now I've just been doing one a month. I did also do a mini series with Jane Brooke earlier on back in January called Biotrucky with the Admiral. We just went through all of season three of Discovery. I'd love to come back and do season four with her if she's up for it when it comes out. We'll see. Fingers crossed. Yeah, I was going to ask if you were going to continue that with other uh, Star Trek actors, if folks were going to come to. Yeah, I, I wasn't planning to start over somebody else. I mean, I, I mean, Jane and I were already good friends, so that that the, the dynamic is already good there. I don't, I don't necessarily just want to like randomly call Armin Shimmerman or somebody like right, that. Right, right. Nothing right. against Armin. I think he's fantastic. <laughs> well, I was going to say you could though. You have that sort of cachet now in the Star Trek universe. Yeah. Right? Well, maybe not that. I don't know. I can just call random people like that. <laughs> but so I mean, continue doing those videos. I mean. On the Star Trek front, you know, I'm hoping to continue consulting as much as the, as much as they'll have me, and then, um, yeah, I mean, I'm I'm giving talks. I'm giving a talk in in August at the Las Vegas, uh, what used to be yeah. called Star Trek Las Vegas, but now this year, since it's not the official uh, Star Trek convention anymore, it's now called 55 Year Mission. I'm giving one at that, right. or giving a couple of talks to that, and then hopefully also a Dragon Con in Atlanta again this fall too, as well as one talk on online Dragon Con also, which has already been recorded, so that one's done. Very good. Very that was good. actually a panel with both Dr. Aaron McDonald and um, 
Mika McKinnon, who I, I believe did a consult for Star Trek Discovery season one for something about the planet blowing up at the end, about Kronos potentially blowing up. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. Good. Um, or in geology, are you are you thinking in in terms? Of, I mean, you've done your 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 book, uh, uh, Live Long and Evolve. Yeah. Are, are you thinking of using Star Trek in terms of your um, your research in any kind of way? Or is I, I don't. I don't. Public I don't have a plan for that. I mean, I could imagine somebody doing some like educational studies on the effectiveness of using sci-fi. I'm happy to help with that, but I can't. I can't spearhead that. I'm not, that's not an area where I'm an expert. I'm, I'd be happy if somebody wanted to like work with me as I'm, as I'm doing my Star Trek class again to do like really rigorous assessments on how well this works relative to a control group or something. That would be great. Oh, interesting. Yeah. I, I couldn't set that up myself. I, I wouldn't know how to, how to do that. So I'm not, I'm not an educational researcher. <laughs> right. Well, what is, so let me ask you this, right? Sure. Star Trek aside. Um, what is your research program apart from the the, the Star Trek science fiction? Sure. Stuff? What is it that you do and that you find sure. fascinating in your work? Sure. So I'm an evolutionary geneticist. And actually, I was inspired as an undergrad by a class just called evolutionary genetics. And what that is, is basically looking at how genetic changes lead to evolutionary changes over time. So one thread that I had for a long time in my research program, still have it going right now, but it's not the, the main focus, is what are the genetic changes it takes to, to change from one species to another? So like how many genes have to change and in what ways to make hybrid sterile, to make it so you don't recognize somebody as a potential mate because they're different. Now they're, you know, they have, you know, red wings instead of black wings or something right. like that, right? Yeah. So that's one threat. Right now I'm looking at the genetic basis of lethal mutation. So every species out there has tons of these lethal mutations. In fact, almost every individual, you and I probably each have some lethal mutations, but we're alive. And yeah. the, the key to that is that those mutations tend to be recessive, meaning that one copy by itself won't cause the effect. But if you had two copies, then you would. This is one of the reasons why inbreeding is bad, because if I had kids with my sister, I don't have a sister. But if I had kids with my sister, then we might bring those two gene right. variants together. Sounds so good. why? But the question is, why are there so many of those? Is it just the mutation rate is so high because there's so many genes that can mutate to that? Or is there some advantage to having one copy of something that's lethal? Because one example of that that's been discussed a long time is um, sickle cell anemia. That if you have one copy of the sickle cell anemia disease gene, you're actually resistant to malaria. Yeah. As a result of that, in populations where malaria is very common, you see a lot more sickle cell. Right, right. Is that, now is that a one-off that doesn't exist anywhere else? Or is there a lot of other cases of that? And then people just haven't figured out what the trait is. So we're studying that right now with uh, wild fruit flies. So every day I have this little bucket section right after we get off this call. I can go outside in the back, catch some wild fruit flies from my backyard. And we bring them into the lab and then we basically, you know, go through and figure out well over half of them have, you know, these, you know, lethal mutations. We just look to see what are they, what's the, the you know, basically what are the genetic changes associated with it? And then we can infer the evolutionary processes that are maintaining them by looking at the DNA sequences around it. Wow. Yeah. Well, it's that's a lot of fun. work itself too. Wow. Yeah. I, well, time. I'm, I'm, uh, Dr. Moore, uh, Noor, I'm, I'm very deeply impressed by just the breadth of your intellectual <laughs> range of working in Star Trek and, and also the scientific, uh, uh, research that you're doing, um, much, uh, success to you. Uh, thank and you. thank you for sharing your time with us here today, uh, to explore a little bit about the scientific background of Star Trek. So, uh, Absolutely. I appreciate very, very much, uh, your willingness to come and join us today. It was an honor. It was great chatting with you too. I'm really excited to see your book when it comes out. Oh, thank you. I'll send you a copy. Please do. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, and thank you for spending your time with us today. If you have any questions or comments or are interested in talking about the scientific background of Star Trek, uh, or how how science and technology are portrayed. Uh, leave us a comment, let us know. You can find us at the Anaris Project at uh, anarisproject.org or all the socials. We're on Facebook, Twitter, uh, Instagram. Uh, you can also listen to our audio at uh, Spotify and Anchor FM. Uh, let us know what you think and uh, we'll be happy to hear from you. Thank you, Dr. Noor. Thank you. Good <laughs> long and prosper. You too. <laughs>